Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, RWJ Barnabas Health, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Investors Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, NJM Insurance Group, and by New Jersey Resources. Promotional support provided by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. And by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. This is the uh, Tisch WNT studio in the heart of Lincoln Center. We're pleased to welcome a good friend, Steve Kornacki. You recognize him from MSNBC and NBC. He's a national political correspondent and author of a compelling book called The Red and the Blue, the 1990s and the Birth of Political Tribalism. How are you doing, Steve? I'm good. Thanks for having me here. People don't realize this who see you nationally, is that you cut your teeth covering politics in Jersey. Yeah, Help fun. Folks. I had three years in New Jersey. I tell people it was my master's degree in practical political science. Um, there is no more fun, interesting, lively, educational place to follow politics, to learn politics, than New Jersey. I, I, I loved it. It's the funnest three years of my career. Well said. The premise of this book, the political polarization, the division, the quote unquote tribalism, Steve, many say, oh my God, geez, this has been going on since Trump became president. You say, no, 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 go back to the 1990s. Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich, what year, what happened? Yeah, well, I, I think it's two things that happened, really. It was, it was that Bill Clinton became the first Democratic president in a dozen years, in right. 1992. And, and then he was met by this Republican Party that in that period of time had been changed. And, and Newt Gingrich was now sort of strategically in Washington, the leader of the Republican Party. And the Gingrich strategy was a break from what Congress had known before. It was about confrontation, about partisan difference, partisan you know, conflict, warfare, really. Right. And so it was Gingrich and this new Republican Party going after this new Democratic president. And it was just a series of never-ending battles throughout the 90s that I think left the country kind of divided into the two camps that today we recognize as red and blue America. But Steve, the personalization, the demonizing, the name calling, the attacks also in the 90s, or is that a newer phenomenon? Yeah, no, I mean, it was there, and it, it was, that was to the part same, of the- To this degree? No, but Talking I think- Talking about women in a certain way, that you know, the Trumps, that yeah. listen, I don't care what your views are, it, he has said what he has said, yeah. and name calling is what a big part of who he is. That was going on between Gingrich and Clinton and others in the 90s? Not, it, not to the same degree, but to a degree that in the time right. would have shocked people. And then it happens and it shocks you. And then when it happens the second time, not as much. But right. when it's taken to the new level, it, it shocks all over again. And I think we were starting to get into that cycle in the 90s, even a few years before. I mean, Newt Gingrich, I say he sort of got strategic control of the Republicans in Washington. I mean, mm. he was doing things on his way up the ladder in, in Washington that hadn't been done before. One of his sort of uh, his big moments prior to Clinton becoming president, he went after a Democratic Speaker of the House. The guy's name was Jim Wright from Texas. Yeah, he shoot it over a book deal. Yeah, this was like shooting a general. You know, you, you didn't do it was this. A book deal. He made some money on the book deal, and right. he said he wasn't supposed to make the money because I guess I forget who bought the book, but it was some donors, lobbyists, right, it was right. friends back in Texas. But then Gingrich like had some way. problems with and then the Gingrich, book deal. What, what am Gingrich, I? Right. I thought my history was wrong. <laughs> right. No. This is. Okay, never mind. It's, yeah, um, this is, it's politics, right? <laughs> fast forward. Trump, give me a couple words to describe him in your view. He is a product 
of that divide that was created in the 90s. He was a, is a product of the merger of politics and entertainment, of politics and culture. Everything that was, I think, kind of created in the 1990s and has sort of been perfected since, for better or for worse, I think Donald Trump is a product of. So Steve, let me ask you this. The polarization, the divide, um, I got some friends in Jersey, Democrats, Republicans, but some of my, quote, Republican friends, big supporters of Trump, sometimes I'll say to them, hey, listen, do you know what he said about Billy Bush on the bus about grabbing women and making fun of women's appearance and the horrible things he said about John McCain not being here? And you go through all that and they'll go, oh, stop, it's just talk. It's his policies, we're doing better. Right. The Democratic friends, if Trump did something extraordinary, I'm not convinced they'd be particularly right. supportive. Right. Is it two camps? Yeah. You hate Trump or yeah. you love Trump there's, or what? There's Trump and then there's just, it, it is red and blue. They're tribes. And you know what? I'm gonna be with Trump because the blue tribe is against him. You know? And, and it's it, everything So it's not just, helps. sorry for interrupting, Steve. Yeah. It's not just, that's the way I voted. It's my tribe? Well, I mean, in, you know what you don't have anymore that you used to have all the time in American politics? What they called split ticket voting. Yes. And you go, I have Democrat all for right. governor, Republican for this office. Every election, and this has gone back now for a couple decades, that number's dropped and dropped and dropped. In 2018, the midterm we just had, hit the lowest point yet. More than ever, people identify personally, culturally, demographically, whatever you want to say, with one party. And I, that's when I start to say it's, it's more tribalism than just partisanship, than just polarization, because it's, it's all one and all against the other. How do we talk to each other, then, with different political... You know, increasingly, we yeah. don't. Say, play that out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, increasingly, we don't, because part of this, I, I think a big part of this is it's the evolution of politics, and I think it's how media has evolved with politics. And you think back a generation or two in, in national media, the big three networks, right? NBC, CBS, right. ABC, that was it. Now we've got cable television. Now we've got cable news. Now we've got cable news that sort of takes on a more sort of- uh, You got websites it, people go to just tell them what they already think they believe. You can create your own media ecosystem. You can surround yourself with pleasing, comforting voices. You can be reminded daily how you agree right. with them. And then that separation between that world and the other world, it only grows. But on the media side, you get folks who say, uh, I mean, sometimes they've uh, joined uh, Joy on Sunday, AM uh, Joy, um, Joy Reid, who's been with us many times. Check her out. When I've done the show, people go, and it doesn't matter what I say. You, you were on MSNBC, and I can't imagine what it's like for you. Yeah. So therefore, if someone sees you on a network, and it, say if I was on doing something on Fox or yeah. whatever, because I don't work for that network the way you do, They'll judge based, they don't judge what you say, they judge what you sure. said, where you said it, and therefore, sure. it can't be legitimate, yeah. or totally legitimate based, is that part of the tribalism? The media comes into it that way? Yeah, no, you're it, part of a tribe now too, to the, some. Well, to, to, not to yeah. you. No, no, right. Not I, to I, you. I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I think that's, that's part of the, what I always tell people at, at MSNBC, for instance, is, you know, the prime time, you know, you got these uh, personality driven shows yes. with very clear points of view, you know, very strong perspectives but on the world. But that's not you. I liken it to the editorial op-ed page of the newspaper. And what I'm trying to do is page one through 14 before you get there. So you can provide sort of the news, the facts, the right down the middle, sort of the, the give people the vocabulary of what's happening in the world that day. And then you flip over at night to the op-ed page, to the opinion page, and you get those shows and you, and you get that. But yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's that distinction that I'm creating, that I'm, that I'm giving you right now. Not everybody sees that, not everybody internalizes it. Happens with us, happens with Fox, happens with, with almost everybody out there these days. It's, it's so fascinating, the time we have people, as if, as if you have different facts on different media platforms based on people's perception of the ideology of their entity, and in public broadcasting, no disrespect to the folks who think what you want to think. We don't have a point of view. Yeah. We don't have a horse in any race. Yeah. Uh, and th that's your philosophy too. But I think there's, yeah. And I think one of the things though, when I say tribalism, and, right. and I see this in politics, sure. and I see this in media, I see this in culture, that I think there's just a part of us as humans that probably goes way back to the, the days of you know, cavemen. I think we are hardwired to be tribal in a certain way. I think that's something that's Politically? With us. In every way, I think there is a tribal <laughs> instinct in us. And I think our media and our politics, if you just go back, I'm gonna say 40 years ago or so, it was in a place that maybe contained that a little. Right. And I think the explosion of media that we've seen in the last you know, couple of decades right. has really maximally lent itself 
to that tribal instinct. And Trump on. has made it more intense? And, and I think, yes, I think he's a product of it and an amplifier of it at the same time. <sighs> Steve Kornacki, um, we are thrilled to have him here on Public Broadcasting, but if you want to know more about Steve's thinking on this, check out his book, The Red and the Blue, The 1990s and the Birth of Political Tribalism. You can check, check, check Steve out, not just on MSNBC, but on the NBC network as well. Steve, I want to thank you. Um, not just for what your career was back in the day in Jersey, but what you're doing nationally now. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Well done. Stay with us. This is One on One. Be right back. To see more One on One with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. One on one is pleased to welcome Jen Kearns. She is a Republican strategist. She contributes to The Hill, The Daily Call. You've seen her on Fox News, MSNBC, Bloomberg, everywhere. You've been a political consultant to the Republican Party. You admit that. Yes, I Proud do. Proud of it. Yes. Even today, yes. as the Republican Party has evolved dramatically. Yes. Very proud of because? that. Well, look, I think Nancy Pelosi, as much as she's proud that she won the House, the Democrats did not do as well as they had hoped to do in the midterm elections. They uh, won a few seats, but go ahead. They did. They did very well in the House. They did not do so well in the Senate. That would and, be true. And I, I'm always a looking ahead to the next election person, because I believe you're only as good as your last election. Sure. So I'm already looking ahead to 2020. And you look at the landscape of 2020, the candidates that the Democrats are going to offer. I don't think they're going to be able to overcome the popularity of Donald Trump. As the popularity of Donald Trump? Yeah. Now, it depends upon which poll you're looking at. Yep. This is the end of 2018. We also don't know what's going to happen. Some investigations going on. I don't know what report comes out. Robert Mueller, we don't know. But um, the Donald Trump, quote, brand of Republicanism and Jen Kearns, as Tom Kane used to say in New Jersey, perfect together. Surprised. My background, I've been awfully tough on President Trump at you sure times. Have. Uh, when he was a candidate, I was a writer for one of the popular debates, I think one of the most watched debates oh, yes, in we know American about that. TV uh, history. Uh, and, you know, I've written for The Hill and some other publications and looking at his record when he was a candidate. I wasn't fond of the fact that he had actually contributed a lot to Democrats. Lots. Lots. Uh, for 30 years, I did a deep dive into his fundraising, and he actually donated quite significantly to Democrats more than Republicans. Including Hillary Clinton. Including Hillary Didn't Clinton. He said great things about Bill Clinton, said he got a raw deal, should never have gone through all that with Monica Lewinsky, whether people, whatever you think is your business. But he was like, hey, he's a great president. What happened? Where's that conversion? Did I miss it? Well, no. I think President Trump holds that uh, position still regarding himself. It doesn't oh, matter okay. what's happening with maybe Stormy Daniels' case. doesn't matter what's happening with Whatever. You know, the other tapes that have come out. You mentioned Billy Bush in another segment. Um, I think President Trump wants to be judged on the merits of his results. And, and I think he's done a tremendous job. If you look at 2020, I think a lot of people are going to cross that aisle in the same way that a lot of Reagan Democrats did. And this is hard to believe. I know for Democrats, I have a lot of friends who are Democrats, w lived and worked in California for 15 years. So you can imagine being a Republican there. I'm surrounded sure. by Democrats, have a lot of friends uh, that are liberals. But I do believe people are going to cross over for a couple of reasons. One, you've got cross the Cross over economy. to vote for Trump. Yes. Including uh, women? Yes. High percentage of women? Yes. So but, as you answer this question, yes. sorry for interrupting. The comments about mocking women's appearance, about I can grab women however I choose to because I'm a celebrity, they like it. Um, all calling women all horrible names. Non-issue? I wouldn't say a non-issue, but it's an issue that can be overlooked. And here's why. You look at the number of white suburban women voters that Democrats claim to be winning across the board. It's not necessarily true. Look at the Senate race, even he was a terrible candidate, but Judge Roy Moore in Alabama. All of those things came out about Judge Roy Moore, the yearbook, the 30 years ago, that big scandal, you remember. Underage girls, if I'm not mistaken, whatever. Nothing so what was you, proven, but I agree. it okay. was white suburban women voters who voted for him. And what does that say about those white suburban women voters? Well, look, I'm not here to, to critique the, the women voters, but what I'm saying is the Democrats don't have a lock on 
the women voters in the way that they say they do. And I think women are going to care about a couple of things in right. 2020. They're going to care about the economy. Sure. They're going to care about the record stock market, which, by the way, uh, Trump critics said would crash within 72 hours of his inauguration. It didn't. Within 72 hours, it actually went to record height. Uh, they're going to care about women's unemployment, which is the lowest sure. point in 17 years. They also might care about African-American employment, which is the lowest in recorded history mm -hmm. ever so they recorded care about GM in leaving States. and thousands of jobs going with it? Um, they do, but look. And saying it, it's connected to trade issues with Trump and other It countries. could be. There's actually been some interesting polling on the trade question. Uh, there is polling that shows nearly two-thirds of Americans actually are willing to take a short-term hit really? for a long-term gain. They understand this, and they understand that the United States has been being abused and used by our trade partners for the better part of 20 years. Yeah. This was through the globalist uh, regime of the Bushes. Um, sure. This was through even, you know, a little bit of Bill Clinton. And, and they don't like that globalist policy. So nearly two-thirds of Americans are saying, you know what, we're willing to take a short-term hit if we're a farmer, if we're a small business owner, if we're going to buy a car, we'll take that hit. As long as it's not sustained going into 2020, I think. Real quick on this. We'll do don't do a, be a political analyst for a second. Yeah. Just in terms of political discourse. You, can, you and I could talk forever about politics in a civil, yep. respectful way. No name-calling, no nothing, no judgments. Even if we agree or disagree, it's irrelevant. Even with public broadcasting, my job is not to have a point of view. The political discourse in our nation and where we are today, does it worry you? Does the nastiness. It, absolutely. The tone, the demeanor. <clears throat> absolutely. To what degree has the president contributed to it, in your opinion? Well, I think he's contributed to it, but I don't think he started it. If you look back, absolutely. You, you look at Barack Obama and Rahm Emanuel were the first ones to say they bring a gun to a knife fight. Uh, you look at Eric Holder, he got caught on tape this election season saying, when, when Republicans go low, we kick them. You look at Maxine Waters talking to people in her district. I'm sure it played well in her district, which I'm familiar with in California. Uh, but she wanted people to push, push back on people. Sure. Cory Booker wants you to get up in people's faces. This is a party, the Democratic Party, that has started a lot of the vitriol and the hate. So you, excuse me, you believe that it's proportional in terms of I President do. Trump, the name calling, the demonizing, the attacks, <clears throat> and what you just described. You think, hey, yes. listen, a pox on, pox on both of their houses. That's correct. You correct. Look, I don't <clears throat> think it's helpful that uh, President Trump says uh, that a woman, if it's Stormy Daniels or anyone else is a horse face. I don't think that was particularly helpful, sure. mostly from a PR perspective. He, he just had a great court victory. They threw her case out, and then he stepped on the headline by, by saying that. So on those grounds, I, I don't think it was necessary for him to do that. Uh, and look, I look at my own Twitter feed as a conservative female. Uh, a lot of death threats on there, a lot of physical threats. There's no threats. place for that. Seriously? There's no place for that. That's Absolutely. Crazy. So let's be clear, whether, whether it's um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders going to a restaurant, can't go with her husband, uh, uh, the, the, the Senate uh, Majority Leader uh, can't go with the family, yep. none of that makes sense. None whether someone's it. a Democrat or Republican, that's just dead wrong on every level. And people who don't call it what it is yes. are contributing to it. Correct. Um, Jen Kearns, I want to thank you hey, for thank joining you us. So we much. appreciate it. Thank you so and, much, And uh, come back anytime and keep sharing your perspectives, OK? Okay. This is one on one. I'm Steve Adubato. Be right back right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Please welcome Mr. Bob Feinberg, founder and chairman of the board, Montclair Film, and also vice president and general counsel, WNET. So you know this place, huh? I've been here. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, good to see you, Bob. Montclair Film, huge, going into its eighth year. Was, quote, just the film festival, now it's so much more. Yeah, that's true. We started eight years ago as an annual film festival, uh, which grew year by year. Great acceptance in the community and beyond. Uh, about three years ago, uh, our friends at Investors Bank uh, donated a 6,000 square foot 1920s bank building right on Bloomfield Avenue in Montclair. Gorgeous. Uh, beautiful building. We um, turned it into the Investors Bank Film and Media Center. Uh, what was on there? We, we 
rebuilt the building. So we launched the capital campaign, which we've just completed $3.5 million um, to build out a 65-seat multi-purpose cinema, um, an education complex where we do classes, uh, and administrative office space for our year-round staff. Because we've really become a year-round arts organization, largely thanks to the building. Right. Uh, we do classes for kids, adults, in filmmaking, improv, comedy. Storytelling. Storytelling. Push the storytelling thing. So, so we started out uh, with a vision about helping people tell their stories. Uh, film, of course, uh, but we've grown. So uh, now we have uh, a podcasting studio uh, in our facility where we teach podcasting classes and where people can come record podcasts. We do live stand-up story slams. Uh, we invite people to come tell their stories. Uh, one night, the theme was cancer survivors, talking right. about how they survived that horrible disease. One night was, the first night was my first time. It was the first time we'd ever done it. We asked people right. to talk about the first time they did something. Don't smile yes. like that. The first no, time it's the first time anything. Anything. Uh, uh, one of my most favorites, because I've got college-age kids. That's right. We had high school kids come read their college essays. Get uh, out of here. It was fantastic. That's fabulous. Really great stuff. So it's so far beyond the great film festival that started eight years ago. Well, it, it, it really, it's grown. We've been, um, we've been embraced by the community. We've been embraced by the, the film industry, uh, by filmmakers and by uh, actors who come uh, year round. Mm. Uh, last night we did a screening uh, of a great doc about uh, Jimmy Breslin yeah. and Pete Hamill. I've heard about this. Uh, What's called, it called? It's called Deadline Artists. Wow. It's going to air on HBO uh, in the new year. And you guys had a screening. We did a we did a members only screening. We have wow. we have so many people have joined to become members. The members only screening sold out. Literally every seat in the theater filled. Uh, the three uh, directors, John Block, uh, uh, John Alter. And right. Steve McCarthy. Jonathan Alter, uh, yeah, our good friend John Alter, who's a wonderful writer and also at NBC. Exactly. They, they were there. We had, um, uh, we had a great Q&A afterwards. So we're doing things like that year-round. And then come May, May 3rd to May 12th, 2019, festival. the festival. So what started out eight years ago as about five days and 45 films, 7,500 people, this spring... It'll probably be about 200 films, 200. Uh, uh, 10 days. Uh, we're on pa on track. Probably about 30,000 people will come to see to see the films during the during the festival. So it's all good. It's great. I know it's hard to get big names, right? Well, but, you know, I don't know. My wife and I couldn't get there that night, but the word on the street is that Stephen Colbert, uh, who has been very supportive, his wife Evie, and you working together on this. I, I, I guess it was a no-name actress that you... <laughs> she's going to be... I she's, think she's got a future uh, in front of her. Uh, Meryl Streep. Mer oh, that's uh, it. Meryl Streep. Uh, came <laughs> and uh, uh, Put did, this a, out here, guys. did right. a conversation. So, uh, as you said, Evie uh, is one of our original board members. She's the president of the board. Right. Um, Stephen has been incredibly supportive. Every year, um, he's done uh, an event for us, which is, which is our gala. So, no... Uh, linen napkins, no right. rubber chickens. Stephen does a conversation. I was there for John Stewart, uh, and also he had um, our friend. Does the other the, the, the political show? Stop. Help me on this. Uh, uh, John uh, Oliver. It's fabulous. Uh, Jimmy Fallon. The place is packed. J.J. Abrams, Samantha B. This year, um, uh, Meryl Streep. So we we do this uh, at NJ Pack uh, in the three thousand seat uh, Prudential Hall. You've been there. Sold Obviously, out. Beautiful venue, sold out. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is, this is really one of the great things about Montclair and a great thing about the film festival. We bring out people. Stephen, pretty unique. But there's, there's tremendous talent. Sure. Uh, and we've, we've been able to, with the help of other sponsors, so Audible sponsors our conversation series. This past festival, Stephen sat down and talked with Ethan Hawke, uh, talked with Rachel Weiss. Um, talked with Bill Nye, the science guy. Great. great, great stuff. Let me ask you, Bob, because I remember when you were starting this, me, you, John Servideo, just said you were talking and you had this idea. Really? What do you want to do, Bob? Did you imagine 
this is what it would become because it's still the story is still being told. Did you see this? You got a minute left. Go ahead. No, no, I, I never thought it, it would grow as quickly uh, and and be so uh, embraced by the community. I, I was afraid I was going to have to go back to people and say, "I'm sorry, we tried. It didn't. You know, <laughs> it's a good idea. It didn't work." It's incredible. It's really it's amazing. It's a great story. Uh, one person with a lot of other people. Great idea. Great community celebrating film storytelling and keeping it alive. Bob, thank you so much. Thank Proud you. Proud of everything Steve. you're doing. Thanks. Thanks. Check us out one-on-one -on -one from the Tisch WNET studio right here in the heart of Lincoln Center. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by NJIT, RWJ Barnabas Health, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Investors Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, NJM Insurance Group, and by New Jersey Resources. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion.